Hey, are you ready to grow your business? You have checked out the number one resource for business leaders, entrepreneurs, startup founders, and managers. And we're going to teach you how to grow and scale your business with real actionable steps. There's no fluff in this podcast. It's just good advice. Today's episode is brought to you by WP Maintenance Plan. You can find out more at WPMP.org. It's a business that will cover handling the maintenance of your WordPress site. Did you know that in order for your website to show up at the top of Google search listings, it has to be in compliance with a heck of a lot of different standards from optimizing the page, from security fixes, from all sorts of maintenance that I don't want to deal with, you probably don't want to deal with, you probably want to just focus on whatever awesome service you offer to your customers. So offload all of that maintenance, all of that technical stuff to WP Maintenance Plan. They'll take care of it at a 100% satisfaction guarantee for only $49 a month. No WordPress site comes out of the box, even meeting two thirds of Google's recommendations for what a website needs to have in order to place high on its search listings. So check out WPMP.org to find out more. Check out this episode. If you're a first-time listener, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And if you enjoy this episode, leave us a five-star review. Today's episode is with Mary Beth Highland, and she's here to talk about how you can create the ideal culture that you want in your company. If you want a company that has values that actually mean something with employees who are engaged and excited to show up day after day after day, you got to check out this episode. Mary Beth is doing work that is so vital to the success of every company, of every organization across the globe. Dig into this episode. She's going to be telling you how you can build the culture you want, especially during a time where it's more important than ever to retain great talent. Check out this episode. Here comes your good advice. Hey, you've checked out another episode of the Good Advice Podcast. Thanks for listening to the podcast today. Man, I got to tell you, there's, this is an episode that I have been waiting to record for quite a while. We've booked this one out for it was about a month in advance, and we're finally here today recording this episode. I'm sitting down with Mary Beth Highland. She's a culture consultant. She's someone who is an expert in workplace culture. If you listen to any of my episodes, you know that this is something that I'm extremely passionate about. I've already been talking a few minutes to Mary Beth. She's going to share some really incredible advice with us today. Mary Beth, thank you for being here. Oh, I'm so honored to be here. Well, I just, I'm I'm thrilled. Like, I'm really excited. I was looking at your LinkedIn bio. And uh, man, we have have a lot to cover in only 35, (laughs) 40 minutes. And so... Let's let's just dive right in. You know, I'll, I'll get some of the background on you just as the conversation gets going. Uh, man, what is going on in the culture world? Because it, it feels like this is such a hip conversation. It feels like everyone's like, oh yeah, the culture is so important. And yet, man, I'm meeting companies who do not understand what that word means. You know, it's the companies who, well, you know, I actually had a company, they were like, well, we do have beer on Fridays. And I was like, okay, well that's cool. But, you know, or they say, well, we do, we let people wear jeans, you know, one day a week. And so that's, that's the response though. When we ask about culture, what's the disconnect? What's happening here? Oh my gosh. I am so glad you brought that up because a lot of times people think that if they have a calendar of events, like beer on Fridays or whatever you just described, or they have a ping pong table or something like, or they have a meditation room that all of a sudden they have culture. And that's not what culture is. That's an aspect of culture for sure. Those experiences are a piece of what creates the day-to-day norms. But culture is the all-encompassing experience, the way that you feel before you get to work, when you're at work, and when you leave. I often hear people say it as the way things are done around here. So it's thinking about also the personality of the organization. So you might have something awesome, like a happy hour experience, but do people want to be there? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I actually worked with a company once that mandated a game night 
And it was one of these experiences where people were like, this was so awkward. Mm. We were told that we needed to start doing something to make our culture better. And so the CEO got this idea in their mind that game night would be the way to do that. And in many occasions, that just feels like an extremely superficial response to deep-seated issues that are going on with interpersonal dynamics within the office. So whenever I'm going into a company, I specialize in values. And I use the formula values times behavior equals culture. So we start by getting really clear on what the values of that organization are. So a lot of times people have a poster on the wall that says what they believe in, and that's about it. That's the Mm -hmm. extent of it, right? It's a... a, I I mean, just to interrupt, I was working with a company and they had this awesome list of values on the wall. And I go, hey, that's a pretty... Because like the HR person was walking me through the company and I go, that's a pretty cool list. And she was like, she didn't even know what I was talking about. She was like, wait, where? what list? And I was like, that big poster right there. And she's like, oh, that? Oh, we just paid a marketing company to come up with that. You know, that, yes. they put that up in the company. And I was like... It's so yeah. fascinating that vision, mission, and values have become this standardized practice that all organizations have, but how rarely they actually use them as a tool for creating the environment that they actually are working towards building and what they're using as their compass and their guardrails for behaviors every day. So when you think about that aspect, your your vision is your why, your mission is your what, and your values are your how, so how you get the work accomplished. So when you think about culture, the way in which you get your work accomplished is really at the core of what you experience on the day-to-day. So that's why I focus so deeply on values. And it feels like values, there's this this strange disconnect that happens from like the executive team to like the frontline employee. And a great example would be something like, you know, you're, you're talking to the executive and they say, they say, um, you know, we really value integrity here or whatever the value is. We really, ra- we really value, you know, customer service here or something. And then you ask the, cu- the, uh, excuse me, you ask the, um, frontline employee and they go, uh, that's not what we value here. Or you ask the customer and they say, yeah, no, that's that's definitely not my... I don't know if, if, if that's your experience at the company, but for me, I did not experience that. And there's this weird, like, the, the boss, leader, whoever says one thing, but realistically, it's not the case. So it, are, are leaders, are they living on another planet? Are they <laughs> detached? I mean, what's why is there such a disconnect sometimes? This is a huge conversation in emotional intelligence. So if there is a lack of emotional intelligence or understanding human dynamics or even the evolution of humanity in the workplace, then there's going to be a disconnect when it comes to these concepts. Because it's not about um, being able to say, all right, we're going to invest in this initiative, quote unquote, and then we're going to get an increased amount of sales by this percent. Right. So it's very hard, I think, for leaders who are used to only making investments based on their return. Mm -hmm. And then the only return that they see as valuable is in profit. Mm. Now, if you invest in your culture, you're absolutely going to see those returns. Right. It's, It's directly connected to people's passion, purpose, productivity, loyalty, engagement, retention, all of those things. It's directly connected to that. But it's such an intangible thing in many ways that when you can start to pin down ways to make things that seem intangible, tangible. So for example, you just talked about some values. Let's just use, say, innovation. So if you claim to have innovation as one of your values, but then you go talk to the employees and you say, when's the last time you were able to be innovative here? And they say, oh, well, the last time I brought up a new idea, I was told I was entitled and that (laughs) this works, right? And we don't need Mm -hmm. to fix anything. Mm -hmm. There there isn't the conversation of, so how does that make people feel? And then how does that create a disconnect from them and the work that they're there to accomplish, the purpose of why they're there every single day, the, the human experience of being engaged. And that's the conversation that we're not having as much. I've even, I've been talking a lot about surveys lately and people often want to use a survey to say, all right, our culture is this now and we're trying to get it to be this later. But the reality is 
people don't honestly respond to those things, uh, uh, particularly if they feel like people are going to find out who answered right. the questions, even if they're supposedly anonymous, there's a lot of fear based on, well, could they track my link in the computer I sent it from and those kinds of things. And so people are not even responding in the most authentic ways when CEOs and leaders say, well, we need to measure this. We have to have a, a strong metric. But the, but the reality is I've, I've actually gone into companies where they'll do a survey at one point and then they'll do the next one right after bonuses are given out mm. or they'll purposely time it to be like around the holiday party or around that happy hour experience because naturally people are going to feel a different way. And when you're in the business of feelings like I am, it changes. It can change on an hourly basis. It's much like what you hear about reputation. So pe- you, you, I'm sure you've heard people say you can take years to build your reputation and minutes to crush it. Right. Mm. It's the same thing for culture. You could have the a thriving, you could be one of the top places to work and then you hire an extremely toxic person and the ship starts to sink mm-hmm. because that's how powerful one person can be, particularly when they have toxic energy and that's what's taking up the space of the workplace. But that, that's actually also what I see a lot in business is that toxic person is usually someone towards the top who, you know, the CEO, for example, is trying to institute, and maybe they're genuinely trying to change the culture. But the, you know, CFO is extremely, I I literally just heard a story from a friend of mine, who it was this this exact situation. And the CFO is extremely toxic, incredibly toxic. And but it's like, okay, this person's been here for so long, you know, really has been part of the company for a while, we don't really want to replace them. And I think it's hard for sometimes for people to understand like culture isn't like, we, you don't say this is culture now, but it's right. kind of like, you know, putting the, the, I don't know the, the analogy, putting the flag in the sand or I, I don't know. Stake in the ground. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're putting the stake in the ground saying this is going to, because it's, it's like anything in life. It costs energy, time, money, effort to actually make a change, whether that's like, you know, physical dietary, you know, going to the gym, what have you. And it, it feels like, it feels like owners aren't, and I don't want to sound cynical. I don't want to sound like nefarious in any way. I just think that people in general are very quick to talk about this kind of stuff. I don't know how eager they are to actually change it. And here's a perfect example of this. The toxic company that instead of fixing toxicity, they say, Hey, let's go do like a team building event. Mm -hmm. Let's go do a ropes course. You know, that's going to, that'll solve it. Or let's do, let's force a game night, you know, get people coming to it. Right. Or even let's put a policy in place for everyone when it's really just this one person who needs to have training or to be go. Yeah. Right. So I worked in an organization where one person had a very serious issue with alcohol and had a very, um, a big sort of blow up, blow out experience at a public event. And then no staff were allowed to drink Mm. ever after that. It was like, well, you can no longer drink at company experiences. And we are putting on networking events constantly. And look, I don't care whether I have a drink or not, but for a lot of people, that's a part of the socializing experience. And so instead of just addressing the one individual that had a serious issue and a mental health issue associated to that relationship with alcohol, um, it was, let's just put a policy in place for everybody. And so it feels like it's more disconnected from the human experience again. What? And what you were talking about with CEOs, right? Like if the CEO is the one who's creating the toxic environment, there's no possible way that organization is going to change unless they actually want to change. Yeah. Well, and it, it you know, your analogy reminds me of, uh, you know, this whole culture conversation is really funny because I used to be a high school teacher a decade ago mm. and was working in this very toxic school. And I remember coming out of that, I've since remembered some of these stories of like, here's a great example. So for lunch, you had an hour lunch and you could go off campus to grab lunch if you wanted, what what have you. We had one teacher who, for whatever reason, just did not come back from lunch. Like just totally blew off the next, the rest of the, um, I mean, talk about just totally unprofessional disasters, whatever. Just didn't come back. Because of this, the administration eliminated our ability to go off campus for lunch, said you can't do that. And all of us were pretty frustrated by this. But I remember people saying, why are we all getting punished for one person's deal? And that's exactly what you're talking about. It's, It's taking a, it's almost like this, 
it, I don't want to, I don't want to throw HR under the bus, but it's kind of an HR approach of, we need a policy, we need a procedure, yes. we need to um, regulate the whole business when really what we really need and what's a lot quicker is just a candid conversation with this one individual. Exactly. And, and maybe put them on some kind of a probationary period, right? Or put some specific accountability measures in place for them because they've shown that they're not accountable instead of let's do a blanketed thing that impacts everybody so everyone's morale is going to go down. And then that's what creates sort of this, this group think around this is just a toxic place to be. It just creates this dynamic of everybody's ready to go. And that's what the talk is around the water cooler. That's what people, I'm in meetings where people are texting each other and they're just talking about whatever the CEO is sharing at an all staff meeting, (laughs) right? Because they're like, oh, here we go again, these kinds of things. And when you can't look at yourself in the mirror and say, how do I play into these behaviors? Like, where am I disconnected from our values? How am I not showing up in alignment with the culture that we want to create here? If you're not willing to do that, then you really can't do this work. And myself included, right? I, I teach people in this area. I consult in this area. I coach people in this area. But I have to constantly be checking in with my own team members and saying, how was I a part of this problem? Where, where did the breakdown happen that I was a part of because if we don't think that we have any involvement in that, then we're really misleading ourselves in recognizing that we're not perfect. We're never, we're perfectly imperfect. Right. And so we have to recognize our own humanity and forgive ourselves and forgive each other when we're willing to look at it, own it and make a choice to do better in the future. It it seems like there's this perfect blend of, ego and lacking self-awareness that that makes this type of person who's unable to really um, recognize that they're the problem, recognize that things need to change, recognizing even that there is a culture problem. You know, I remember I talked to a woman who she was saying her staff had turned over twice and she wanted to know how to find better employees. Mm. And she was like, you know, and you know, I'm a millennial and she was like, you know, millennials are just so hard to manage. And I was like, okay, is, is this really an issue of a certain <laughs> generation or... You know, but so I, I was talking to her and I said, you know, well, in my experience, when a staff turns over twice, it's usually not the employees, usually it's the boss. And she goes, well, if you were to tell me it was my fault, I wouldn't want to work with you. And that was, mm, that was pretty insightful to me. Your answer. I, well, yeah. And I just thought, and it's funny how the more I've worked with people, it seems like it is this blend of, and it's not necessarily like narcissism or anything that's like a titanic ego, but definitely like this, it's not me, it's you. And this inability, you know, I think about the, C- the example you just gave, the people are texting and totally probably disengaged and the CEO is really just, you know, maybe going through the agenda notes or sharing whatever latest information there is. It feels like there's a, a wide range of owners and leaders who are not self-aware. Yeah. And I would just say there's a wide range of humans that are not self-aware, right? <laughs> so sure, a lot of them happen to come into positions of leadership, but in general, this is not something that we are taught. This is not something that as a society we have shown yet that we value because there is not investments in this area being made in how we're educated. It's not being invested in how we're trained. It's not being invested in the decisions that we make on who becomes in, goes into a leadership position. So I'm sure you've had these conversations with people about folks who just become a manager of people because that's the next step in their evolution at work. That's the next step in their ladder in their career. But they are so poorly skilled when it comes to the people side. And so you're basically setting people up for failure. So this woman that that you're talking about, that's the kind of thing that the organization at large should say, hey, what's going on here? that two rounds of team members have turned over and maybe this person shouldn't be in this position and maybe they shouldn't be here at all, depending Mm. on what their responsibilities are and what they're, what they need to do in order to move the organization forward. Because so many people are taking on those roles, not because they want to, but because that's what gets them more pay. That's what gets them the next title. And they figure they'll just like figure it out once they get there. And oftentimes they wind up just ignoring their teams completely and working with several organizations right now where that's the case. And they're 
they just never had any training or expectation set or skill development in that area because people don't treat it with the same level of intensity as they would a sales training. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I have, just like you're saying, I mean, I have empathy for those people in the sense of some people are pursuing that next step for selfish reasons. Many of them, it it's, I, I empathize with the person who's been put into leadership who has never been taught how to be a leader and especially the person who um, they, they've never been shown, here's how you move from being an individual contributor to actually worrying about other team, other team members. You know, and for right. a lot of these leaders, I was just meeting with the company who they were, we were talking about this, this topic of we can't, our leaders are not thinking about their teams as much. And I basically said, well, I mean, are you guys giving them the space to do that? Or does, or does every leader have their own set of tasks and fires to put out? And, and we don't even, and, and that's kind of my point is we don't even always give them the space to even explore right. what does it mean to, to lead my team. Right. Right. And what does that mean for me as a unique individual? Because just like a company has a set of values, each of us as humans, as individuals, right. we have a unique set of values of things that drive us. So when we're out of alignment with our own values and there's a disconnect between the organization's values and you are now in a position where you're supposed to manage people, it's a very chaotic internal experience that's happening because it's like, well, what, 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 who am I supposed to be? How am I supposed to show up? Okay, it's actually easier for me to just shut down and not do any of those things <laughs> because it gets very overwhelming. And obviously that's not everyone, but that is a big trend that I see of just a big disconnect when it comes to that awareness and emotional intelligence. But again, it's not necessarily just from a, a leadership perspective. It's just because we haven't valued this as a society. And I do see that changing. I see huge shifts in this area happening. I'm really grateful to be in this space because now more than ever, people are recognizing that this is not something you mess around with and that you need to invest in it. And I'm in a position now where my, my clients are just so grateful to be working together because emotional intelligence is an actual skill. <laughs> it's not just something that you're lucky if you have it. It's something that you need to build and develop and hone in on. And even someone who has it naturally, like myself, I've, I've always been very prone to being able to connect with people easily and, and those kinds of things ever since I can remember. But I have built and harnessed and honed in on and sharpened those tools in my toolkit because that's the only way I can be successful in this work. And I think the more that people recognize how important it is to build those skills, the more they're going to become those leaders that people want to follow, right? The people that no matter where you wind up going, you're going to have a team that wants to come with you if it's not at that organization because they're inspired every day. All of my business has been built on my own personal evolution in really going back to my whole life's history and learning all the ways that I've gotten in my own way, what my wounds, what the wisdom was that I could pull from those wounds and how could I use that as a tool, not only to serve myself, but to use in all experiences in work and life and relationship development, because we don't talk about those things. And when people can start talking about them from the perspective of their own hero's journey, other people start to see themselves and start to feel permission to talk about them too and recognize that there's actually ch a chance for them to do that as well. And maybe this is the person who can help me mm -hmm. start on that journey. And that has been just the greatest gift. It's like every day at work is another day for me to grow as a person in, in addition to grow as a business owner and help my organizations grow. Mm. Well, and you, you know, it, it's obvious that I could ask you like 20 million questions on culture <laughs> and you would have like the perfect, I mean, it's obvious you really, you really get this stuff. Thank I, you. I would love to just to take a second and kind of peel back the layer. Cause we have, I have listeners on the podcast who they're, they're entrepreneurs, they're business owners themselves. And I always like to give a little bit of context um, as to the person who's on the show and like what what their journey's been like. So talk to me about you know when did you when did you start your business and how did you how did you even get into into doing this kind of work? I know it's such an it's such a funny question because I I don't have a direct path. So I I, I love this question because I very much fell into it in some ways. So before I started Spark Vision, my company, which I've had for about five years, I'm going into my fifth year, which, I was which, working... And I did interrupt you, but this, for the listeners, this speaks to, 
uh, Mary Beth's credibility because you not only have you beaten the statistic of like the one and two year mark, but you've done it. You've done it in the consulting space, which I don't know if you've noticed this, but everyone and their mom is a consultant now, especially on I LinkedIn. Know. And I so know. the you know for the listeners, this is somebody who man five years. That's a massive achievement. That's an incredible Thank achievement. You. I didn't mean to interrupt you. you. I just had no, to be obnoxious. A good interruption. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, as you I were saying. I appreciate that. And and hey, look, in those in those five years, I would say that there have been incredible setbacks and incredible wins, which I'll come back to. So it is it certainly has not been an easy, smooth sailing, like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. five years, no big deal. Like it, <laughs> there were certainly moments of time where I was like, I can't do this anymore. This is too stressful. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to pay my next bill, those kinds right. of things. But I got to this space because before I started Spark Vision, I was working for a global nonprofit where I had developed the best practice model for engaging young professionals across the country. And I was training people actually all over the world. This was uh, uh, an organization that had a presence globally. And when I was deemed as the person who created this best practice model, I was both excited and confused because... I had only run the program for a year and a half, and that's when headquarters came to shadow me. And they said, you are officially the best practice model. And the reason behind that was because they'd never seen membership increase that quickly. They'd never seen so many people fall into leadership roles, like with passion and enthusiasm. So membership quadrupled in the first year that I took over. And within a year and a half is when they dedicated it as the model to replicate. Wow. So I was coaching and training people and the questions I were getting, I was getting were things I I wasn't sure that I'd be able to answer because I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to help this organization in Costa Rica or in Germany or even in California. I'm based in Baltimore, Maryland. I I thought they're going to have such a different set of issues, but the reality was they were all based on culture. Mm. It all came back to how do we create an environment where people want to be here And how do we even get them to show up in the first place? And those aspects of my job were the things that came easiest to me because that was a natural way of my being. My background's in social work and I have a master's in nonprofit management. And so for me, it it just was like, well, what do you mean? This is this is step one. You just talk to people. You do things that they want. You empower them in the process. You make sure you're listening and getting feedback and then responding based on that feedback. You have open communications. Like These were things to me that because I was pretty naive at the time, I thought everybody knew how to do that because it was natural for me. And so very quickly, I learned these were really difficult skills to develop for people who didn't have them already. And this was the kind of thing that if this one organization was struggling this much with engaging young professionals and creating these environments, there had to be more. And that's what really got me to get out and on my own. So I started off really focusing on that millennial demographic because that's what I was known for. I was known for developing this young professional model. And I tried as hard as I could to shake it because it felt like this gum that was stuck on the bottom of my shoe that I just like couldn't get off because everybody kept seeing me as the millennial engagement person. And what I kept trying to say is it's, this is not a millennial thing. This is a human thing. This is what we all want as humans. Mm -hmm. And much to your example earlier about the, the supervisor saying, I just don't know how to work with these millennials. It's like, this is actually not about the age. This is yeah. what everybody wants. It's just that this demographic isn't willing to just put up with it and stick around and hope things get better. They're going to move on because there's other options and there's other opportunities, particularly if there's someone who identifies as high achieving or somebody who's really wanting to, to feel successful. They're not going to sit around and hope things get better as a volunteer. They're going to find another place to volunteer. Right. And that goes the same in organizations, right? So if you're dedicated even deeper in your day to day, your nine to five, how can you create these environments where people want to be? And again, that to me was very natural. And so this, I would say uh, the first probably three years, the majority of my work was going into companies who said, we don't know how to deal with these millennials. And that would get me in to the, to start talking to the CEO and the HR people. And then I'd say, okay, well, what about everyone else? 
Yeah. <laughs> because if we start creating a program for one aspect, one generation within your company, you're actually going to polarize people more than bring them together. What if we started to think about ways that we can create experiences where most people want to be there, right? We're not going to get something with 100%. That's setting false expectations. But what can we do that we can help people realize we're more alike than not? How can we start to create um, bridges instead of making more silos based on specific demographics about ourselves? So, and that's not to say that I, I don't believe in, I think it's great to have women's programs and all those other kinds of specific demographics. But I think when it comes to age, um, that's one that's a really not necessary. It's not necessary for us to polarize ourselves in, in that way. In fact, we have so much more to learn by contributing across the, the generations. And, and in, in my own evolution of this business, I was just feeling so frustrated that these were the conversations I was having all the time. I would much rather talk about a CEO that doesn't have emotional intelligence than why can't I get these millennials to get on board? Because to me, that's just this incredible disconnect. It's, it's starting off in a deficit base, a deficit mindset, and recognizing that um, we all have these opportunities. All of us across the generations have these opportunities of, to improve ourselves, to do better. And when we can start to really tackle what's actually going on, so if it's a disconnect in leadership and, and their own awareness of how their behaviors are impacting people, or if that's more global across the entire institution, why don't we just talk about what it is instead of trying to pigeonhole it into a certain age group? Um, and, and it was in that time actually that I was having this internal struggle with how do I get this millennial thing off my plate that I had a huge drop in my business. So I, when I first started, I had Johns Hopkins and Cystic Fibrosis Foundation hire me right off the bat. Like I was out maybe on my own for two, three months. Cystic fibrosis had me develop a national program for them for engaging young professionals. And Johns Hopkins had me do a whole culture analysis for them and segmenting across the generation. So I was like, this is going to be easy. Yeah, like being an entrepreneur is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, wow. oh, and, and neither one of them did I prospect. <laughs> Both of them came to me and it was a more, very organic experience, but it was based on the reputation I had built in my last job. So I was under the impression this is just how it worked as an entrepreneur. And that oh, was wow. just what it was going to be. And so I hired a, an outsourced CFO to help me out. I was feeling really great about everything. And my, those big contracts came to an end and because and I was done the work, right? The work was completed. And so she's like, so what's coming next? Like, what are, what are you, how are you going to replace that revenue? And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and she's like, well, who are your prospects? I'm like, I don't do that. I you know, <laughs> people come to me. And so this was my own naive way of believing right. like, you know, <laughs> What do you, what do you, I don't know because I had never had to do that before. And so I went into actually a pretty major depression. I, I woke up every morning feeling like a humongous loser. I had suicidal ideation. I felt like nothing that I did mattered and was worthwhile. And there was, I, I was just, just straight up depressed. And that was a good three month span. And naturally, work did not come my way when I was in that space. Mm -hmm. And so I had to do some really deep work and some deep, again, more healing. We always are constantly needing to heal ourselves around um, those feelings about myself and recognizing that that disconnect was happening because the work I was doing was not aligned with my values. Mm -hmm. It was what other people wanted me to be not what I saw myself as. I was fitting into the mold everybody else wanted me to step into instead of breaking the mold and creating the one that was authentically who I am. Mm -hmm. And so since having that epiphany and really building on that knowing, I'm now in a position where I don't have capacity to take on new clients. Uh, I do three-year engagements. I am at my max as far as like long-term engagements for this year. We quadrupled our revenue already, and it's just the beginning of March uh, this year. <laughs> and it's one of those things that's like, this all happened as a result of shedding expectations of what other people wanted me to be and stepping fully into myself, into my values and having a life of in alignment. Because when you're doing that, 
people are attracted to you and they feel it and they know it and they want some of that. So it's a really amazing experience to have these huge companies. I mean, I'm having global companies reaching out to me saying, we heard about you through such and such. Uh, when can we get a meeting on the books? So it's amazing to, to feel like that's actually possible when you are living in alignment with your true self. Mm. Now, give me, give me something, um, like help me see like sort of the practical step into that. Cause I think, I think people listening, they, they hear this kind of language. They've heard it maybe before where it's like, okay, I know I need to, I need to know my values. I need to walk in my values. If I'm a business owner, obviously it sounds really great for my revenue to quadruple or just to make, yeah. just to make more money in general. So I, I think, I think the listener is hearing that thinking, yeah, I, I want that. But like, what, is, what does that like really mean to like be in tune with your values, to sort of shed these other expectations? I mean, what, how do you walk that out? Well, you just set me up perfectly to tell you about my course that I have. <laughs> <laughs> we did not plan this, by the way. We did not plan this. <laughs> That's great. Um, I, I, in addition to doing the culture work, I'm also a mindfulness and meditation instructor on the platform Insight Timer. So Insight Timer is a global app. They have about 12 million users globally. And I have a 10-day audio course on there called Knowing and Living Your Values. And it's literally 15 minutes a day for 10 days. And you can go through this whole process. So it starts off with knowing. So what are the words that actually define your values? We often say we value things like our families or our friends, but that's something that you care about, not necessarily right. your core values. Right. So what, what is it about those things? Is it a sense of belonging? Is it connection? Is it true friendship? Right. So like, what are those actual words? So you can start to say, this is me. Right. And also be able to say, this is not me. That's actually not me. So I'm not driven by wealth. But yet that's now something that describes me that I never thought was going to be a part of my identity because I've never been like, oh, I have to make this much money and that's what makes me successful. Um, and so it's fascinating to see how your values can also evolve over time depending on how you're showing up in the world. But, but through this, this course, you actually get, a, you do a values inventory on yourself. So you learn, here is my profile of what it looks like for me. And then you go through looking at where are my behaviors in or out of alignment with those values. So for example, authenticity, that's something that drives me in a huge way. And that's also where that's being thrown out all over the place now. And like, what does that actually mean? Right. And so to be able to find what that value means to you versus what the dictionary or Google says, like, what does authenticity mean to you? Mm. And for me, that means to feel in alignment with whatever thing that's coming out of me is a reflection of my soul. So that's me, the Mary Beth definition, definitely not what you're going to find on Webster, but it's the type of thing where. I can tell when I am not doing that because I can feel it inside of me, right? I know that I'm just saying something to make somebody happy or I'm pulling out the statistic because I think it's going to impress them versus this is who I am, take it or leave it. And I'm not going to be for everyone and that's okay. And in the beginning of my work, uh, one of the big reasons of disconnect was that I was trying to chameleon myself into my client's desires and expectations of me, instead of saying, no, actually, I'm the expert in this space. This is what I believe we should do. Here's where we're going to move next. This is going to be how we get to the next place. And if that doesn't feel like the right process for you, I can be accommodating in some ways, but in other ways, I might not be the right fit. And that's where we need to reevaluate whether or not we should have this partnership at all. And that has been incredibly empowering. So when you can really be able to say, okay, well, that disconnect happened because I wasn't authentic and that's one of my core values, then you can start to use it in a very tangible way versus more of this kind of ethereal conceptual way of like, oh, do I feel good right now? In this moment right now, I can say this experience with you on this podcast is, a, is, a, is an experience of alignment for me because of the things that are my values. So I feel like there's authentic connection between us. I feel like there's a sense of belonging. You've made me feel a part of this community very quickly. 
I feel like we can be um, vulnerable and that you have empathy. Those are all things that are important to me. Now I have been interviewed on other podcasts where I did not feel that way. Right. And so I left like a, uh, I don't know if that was a good use of my time or energy. And I don't even know if I'm going to be able to connect with this audience because I wasn't really in alignment with myself when I showed up. So to be able to say, well, that's why, that's why, because it, these are the values that were not there, or that's why it was so great because these are the values that were there. When you can develop that level of emotional intelligence, you can really make choices a lot faster. You can cut through a lot of the noise and it's an incredibly empowering experience of not looking to other people to give you the answers, but looking within before you go out. I think you've, you've hit so many great concepts there just in, in just in the last few minutes, but I, I totally agree. It's, it's like your ability to put the language behind your values. And I love what you said too, because having done like this values conversation, a lot of times, man, everyone's go-to is family or, yeah. or, or integrity or honesty. And it's these very, um, and, and I love the word you used. The, these are very ethereal terms, very ambiguous terms. They're, they're sort of feel good terms. But there's not a lot of dialogue around, okay, what is, that, what is that really and what does it really mean for how you approach business, how you approach yep. management, life, what have you. Um, so I, I, think, I think you've nailed it with that for sure. Thank you. And that's why I have people define them for themselves because it's, we're not working from the same def definition. So if you said honesty was your core value, I would want to know, well, how do you define that? And how do I define that? Because there could be nuances to that where there's a disconnect and there could be places where they're the same. And particularly when I'm doing this work with companies, I make sure the whole organization is in agreement with the definition of that word and how it relates to their organization versus what looks good for a piece of marketing collateral. And see, that's, I think that's the key right there. It's because it's even, it's even less the actual word. Because actually what I see in, in businesses is there's a lot of dialogue around the wordsmithing. What well, has to be this word? What well, has to be that word? When actually the, the magic is exactly what you just said. It's what does, are we all on the same page in terms of what this actually means? Uh, which if you're not, then, you know, the company then continues to act in a way that um, some people see it as one way, other people see it as a different way. And I think a lot of times in management even, and I know we're, I know we're running out of time, even in management, it feels like leaders, they, there's friction and tension there. And they think it's because of generation or um, even their own ability to manage when really it's just totally different perceptions on, um, you know, maybe let's, like, let's say work-life balance is a value of a company, um, which I don't know if it ever would be, but you know, you could have people who totally have different understandings of what that word means and can cause a lot of friction. Right. Some people think work-life balance <laughs> is being able to wear jeans. <laughs> Honestly. And, and that's like, check, we did it. Yeah. Versus feeling like you are, have a sense of inner harmony. Yeah. Right. There's a well, big difference. <laughs> Mary Beth, this has been an awesome podcast. It's been so great to connect with you. Is the course, is the best way to access the course on the app? Yes, yes. You can access it on the app or if you want to go to my website, sparkvisionnow.com slash events. It's listed at the top of my events. It's something that anybody can access all over the world 24 seven. And if you want to take that course specifically, it's a one-time investment of $20. So a really affordable way for people to take a deep dive into knowing and then living their values. So right. hey, I hope that others will join I, I cannot me. believe how cheap this is. Hang on. It's, tw <laughs> it's, it's 20 bucks. Okay. Yeah. 1999. Okay. 19 so, so here's the deal. Here's what I will say. So in, in literally, and I'm, I'm not blowing smoke here, in lit for the listeners, in the 45 minutes I've talked to Mary Beth. So I've, I've been in this space for probably four or five years now. Instantly, I knew that Mary Beth is an expert on this topic. I mean, instantly can easily tell this person knows her stuff, knows exactly what she's doing. I will buy you I will buy someone this $20 course. If you're, if you really want to take it, but you're thinking, you know what? I can't afford it, which I don't know what, you know, you're going to spend $7 on a, on a, on a cup of coffee. You can afford it. Email me and I will buy it for you. Okay. Oh Cause this, this is way too inexpensive. You're amazing. Uh, she needs to charge more. First of all, that's a different conversation. 
But if you're listening, you're thinking, I like this person, you need to go buy this right now. I'm, I'm being heavy handed with the sell here because I really, really believe in what Mary Beth is doing. Oh, thank um, you so much. I really appreciate that, Blake. Mary Beth, yeah. you're also active on LinkedIn, right? Very active on LinkedIn. Yes. Pretty much post multiple times a day and I love the community there. So please connect with me. I'd love to have you as part of that community. Great. Well, I will um, put the links for your website and for your LinkedIn profile in the episode description. Uh, Mary Beth, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. I'm so, so grateful. And I really, I'm blown away by your offer there. So yeah. I can't wait to see if anybody <laughs> takes you up on it. We'll see. My, my listeners are very good at listening. I don't know how good they are <laughs> at acting. So, uh, hey, listeners, you need to act. And one great action you can take, this is a nice little uh, subtle transition, you can subscribe to the podcast if you're a first-time listener. You can also leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed this episode. And hey, for real, if you want to take me up on my offer, I'm going to give it out because I got a baby coming. So I'm not going to give it to everyone, but I will give it to someone. Email me, Blake at goodadvicecoaching.com and say you want this offer. Literally, I will pay it out of my pocket and give it to you. Um, other than that, thanks for listening. Thanks for the support and we will catch you later. See ya.